everyone here and to everyone joining us online. We are beyond grateful that you have chosen to enter into God's presence today through worship. As this is the beginning of the Christmas season, a wonderful Christmas season, let us remember the love the Father has for us. Our Father sent His Son to the world to be the hope of the world, to be Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 says that He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Where in your life do you need Emmanuel? Where do you need hope? Will you take a moment and allow God to bring that to, to, to the forefront right now? Let us pray and invite God into this morning as we begin. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your son. Thank you that he is our hope. Father, we thank you for the season and for the wonder and joy that it brings. But Father, we know that it is not joyous for everyone. And this season can bring pain. And Father, we just pray that you enter into that pain um, and that you heal all of those broken parts that are, that are within us, Father. Father, we love you and you are so worthy to be praised. Amen. Stand with us and join in worship.
turn and tell your neighbor your favorite Christmas song. So go ahead and do that. Lamentations 5.19 says this, but you, O Lord, remain and reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to all generations. Do you know that the Lord reigns this morning? The Lord reigns this morning, so let's give him the praise that he is due. Amen? Amen, church.
Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, so let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. And as you're taking a seat, go ahead and grab that seat card that was on your chair as you came in. Because as you can see, this room has been transformed. The lobby has been transformed. So I get to talk about our Christmas services with you all. And we have a couple different opportunities this year. The first is our blue Christmas service. Um, and if you've never heard of that before, that's a service that is specifically for those who are just experiencing hardship or grief or loss. Um, I know I was in that boat last year. I did not wanna be happy and put on the smile and do all of the Christmas caroling because there were some really, really hard things going on in my life. Um, and I would have loved to have a space just to sit before the Lord and cry with other people that were hurting. Um, and so I'm gonna be at that service. I would love for you to join me just as we bring our different losses, whether it's the loss of a family member or a job maybe or a dream, anything that is hard going on in your life that you would say, I think I need a break from all of the happy, jolly Christmas season and I just need to bring some things to the feet of Jesus. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna bring our pains and then receive the hope that he has to offer us in those really, really hard seasons of life. 
And then we also have our celebration Christmas services. We have four of them. Some are on December 23rd, Saturday at 4 and 6. And then the very next morning on Sunday morning will be our normal service times at 9.30 and 11. So I hope that you can make it, but also the card that's in your hand, I hope that you'll use that as just an invitation to somebody that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, Last year, we had a blizzard happening during our services, and 48 people still came to know Christ. So imagine if, yeah, we can clap for that. That's amazing. So imagine this year if we don't have a blizzard, and each person in this room invites someone that doesn't know Jesus, they'll hear the gospel and have an opportunity to respond to that. So I'd love to see these chairs filled with people that maybe have never heard of Jesus before, and I'm excited to see how God uses that time. And even leading up to the Christmas services, we have a really cool opportunity. In the lobby is a tree full of all these little cards. And this is our serving or acts of service tree for the month of December. And it's really just to live out of a place of generosity and service and meeting needs of people that are all around us. And so the invitation for you is, as a family or as an individual, going up to the tree and looking through these cards. Some of them have financial opportunities or donation-based requests. Some of them are just acts of kindness, like shoveling your neighbor's driveway. And then some of them are even sponsoring a family in our community with different things. So I would encourage you, on your way out, stop at the tree, look through one that your family is excited about, that you can commit to in the month of December. And I think that's going to ripple effect out into our community in some really, really cool ways. Um, Even as we're in this season of serving and giving, I was reminded of a verse this past week that talks about how each of us should give based on what we've determined in our heart. And that's why we do stuff like the giving tree. That's why we include our tithings and our offerings in the service is because it, it really is an act of worship for us just to go to the feet of Jesus and ask him, how are you inviting me to step out in faith with my finances? So I would encourage you this month, if you've never done that before or it's been a while um, since you've just surrendered your finances to him, just simply ask the Lord, how are you inviting me in the month of December to step out in obedience? And we'll see how God uses that in some really cool ways throughout the kingdom. So without further ado, I'm excited to start our Christmas series today. So check out this intro video that we have for you. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. It's just good to see all of you. Good to see all your faces. Thank you for joining in person today. Uh, But also, welcome to you if you're joining and watching online. Uh, So excited for what we get to dive into and jump into today. I get to talk about hope. And uh, hope's a funny thing, isn't it? Anybody ever been taken on a roller coaster by this thing called hope before? Hope for uh, Lions fans, you ought to raise your hands in this room. Come on, you are riding the hope wave right now. Right, hoping, waiting, hope implies hardship, it implies waiting, uh, but this time of year too, I mean, when we get parties and you think about presents and stuff, I mean, hope, hope takes us on a variety of different experiences and emotions. Uh, the, what I think of is like a white elephant gift. You know what I'm talking about? Like a white elephant party. If you've never done one of those before, it's where everybody buys something that's approximately worth the same value, uh, but you know, if you actually want like a good gift out of this thing, you will be the one that's disappointed. Uh, a white elephant gift, this is where all the re gifts happen. So uh, we go into this for my family. Our family lives in Wisconsin, part of it. So Shannon and I were driving out last year for Christmas and we forgot to pick up a white elephant gift. And we always want to like spice it up and change it up. And by we, I mean I. So I like to stir the pot. So I, I got this idea about an hour away. We had to stop and get gas. And I walked in the gas station and I went, I'm going to buy a bunch of scratch-offs. I think this is going to be hilarious. So I, I'd never bought a lottery ticket before. I just went up and went, uh, I, need, I need like $20 worth. Like, is there a good one to get? And she goes, I don't know. I was like, just 
you pick. I don't know. So she, she prints off four or five of these lottery tickets, and I get in, and Shannon looks at me, my wife, and she goes, are you serious right now? I was like, it's for the white elephant gift. This is going to be awesome. And she goes, your family can't handle that. And I started driving, and I started thinking about those words. I was like, she's right. A million dollars will destroy my family. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, if a million dollars, you add a million dollars into that type of equation, my family is fragile enough. You add a million dollars, especially in the wrong person's hand, my family's over. We're never going to celebrate anything together again. So I start, my mind just starts racing, right? Hope, right? It's like hope, I hope the game is fun. And then I hope, you know, we get a winner. And then I hope maybe we don't get a winner. And then I hope the wrong person doesn't get, hope is taking me on this roller coaster. So we get to the place where we're staying. We walk inside, we put the boys to bed. And before Shannon can even come down, I race down the stairs. I grab a quarter. I scratch off all of the tickets. I was like, my family can't handle it. And so I'm scratching. I'm like, I'm sparing my family division, dysfunction, anger, hatred. I scratched all of them up to make sure there was not a good winner in any of them. I looked. I went, no, there's like $15 of winnings. I put it in a bag, and that was my white elephant gift. True story. The best part is when our family is doing the white elephant gift and, and my little cousin got it and she opened it up and she goes, lottery tickets. Are these scratched off already? And I went, yes, they are. You have no idea what I just spared everyone here for. There's 15 bucks in there. You be quiet. And she's like, okay. Hope. Hope is what we're going to talk about. Isn't it funny how hope, I mean, it can bounce from thing to thing to thing. What we hope for can change. It can change in an instant. But hope implies hardship, doesn't it? Hope implies that we're in a season or we're in something, we're in a circumstance that maybe isn't the way exactly that we would like it, but we hope that it can get better or we hope that it can change or we hope that something can, can turn out for better, even if the circumstances or the, the limitations that we're experiencing right now may tell a different story. So here's the funny thing about hope. Hope is something that all of us experience. We all know what it's like. It's common to every one of us, but it is always paired with waiting. Anybody here love to wait? Waiting's awful, isn't it? It's hard. It's painful. It's that season where it's like, man, I, I'm hoping for a change. I'm hoping for an outcome. I'm hoping for a positive health result. I'm hoping for a, a positive pregnancy test. I'm hoping for an income raise. I'm hoping for something. But the state that I am in right now is silent. The, the series that we're diving into right now, it's a series called The Spirit of Christmas. And it looks at the role that the Holy Spirit played in the Christmas story. But the person that we're going to look at today, his name is Zechariah. He's a man that was familiar with waiting, but he's also a man that was familiar with hope. And Zechariah had waited years and years and years, decades even, for a child and never got it. Check out this story if we read it together. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was burning, a great crowd stood outside praying. So Zechariah won the lottery. Like that, that's literally what happened in this story. There, there was a lot, right? A lot would be cast and Zechariah was a priest. So there were a group of priests, many priests, and they would be selected one time of year. There'd be one specific priest that would get selected and his role was to go inside the temple, inside the most holy of holies, the holiest place, the place so sacred and so set apart, so righteous, so perfect. It was where the presence of God was. And if you did not have a a reason for being in there as in once a year somebody would be allowed if you would go in without without invitation or outside of the ritual that was set apart you, you would die that's how sacred this place was and holy this place was so once a year one person would be selected they would walk into the holiest place in the temple and they would burn incense and what that priest would do is offer a prayer not for themselves not for any personal ambition or desire that priest would function as an intercessor for the entire nation so Zechariah was chosen he was chosen by lot 
And he walks into the temple. He's the last piece. And it says there's, there's hundreds of people that are outside of the temple. And they're all waiting. And they're all praying because they know this person is praying for them and especially for the Messiah. There would have been 400 years that had already gone by of silence where the people knew that a Messiah was promised. They knew that God had, had orchestrated everything so in a way that there would be a Messiah, he would be promised, he would be delivered, and the Messiah would be for the people. And so when the priest would go in, he would undoubtedly be praying, God, please send us that Messiah. But that period of waiting that they were in as a nation was the period, a lot like the period of waiting that Zechariah and Elizabeth had been in. Season after season, after season, after season, hoping for something incredible, hoping for an answer, hoping to finally receive the thing that was promised, but yet waiting. If we keep reading, it says this in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 11, it says, While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. He says this, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Zechariah has an unbelievable encounter. I mean, remember I told you, no one else would be permitted in this space. So here's Zechariah, and he's ministering before the Lord, and he's praying for the people, and he's praying for the Messiah, and then right in front of him stands an angel in all of its glory, an angel, a messenger of the Lord, and it says Zechariah was terrified. Of course he was. He was terrified. And the angel says something that's so significant and so profound in this story. It's so easy to skirt right past it because you're just caught with going, man, he's like a normal guy. He's ordinary. He's doing what he was called to do. And God interrupts and speaks into the, the deepest moment of waiting for all of the nation, all of the people. God interrupts and speaks. But what the angel says is so significant. The angel says, God heard you. God heard your prayer. God has heard your prayers your pleas with your wife. The tearful nights, the waiting, the disappointment, month after month after month after month for decades. When Zechariah maybe questioned the goodness of God or questioned, does God care or does God listen? Is God close or is he far? The waiting and the waiting and the waiting and the roller coaster of emotion that comes with it. The angel speaks to Zechariah, says, don't be afraid, but I want to tell you this. God hears you. Isn't that such a powerful truth? That regardless of what season you're in, regardless of what hardship you're enduring right now, regardless of the question that you desire to be answered, regardless of the child that maybe has run so far away from you or your family or the church or God, regardless of the, the season of question around your health, regardless of the season of life that you're in wondering what's next or is this all there is, regardless of the season or situation that you're in right now, the truth is this, is that God actually hears you. That he hears your prayer. That he's a lot closer than you might think he is. The story continues. It says, for he will be great, talking about the son that will be gifted to Zechariah, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth and will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. This part jumps off the page for me because notice, here's Zechariah. Zechariah is in the temple not praying for a son, even though that's what he had prayed for probably for decades. He's not praying for a son. He's praying for his country. He's praying for his people, the people of Israel, God's chosen people. He's praying for them and praying that God would deliver the promise that he had promised centuries earlier. And here's what God says. He says, I'm not just going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a son that will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. I'm going to give you a son that's going to turn the affections and the attention and the desires and the hopes not to themselves, not to politics, not to the country, not to anybody else, 
but the Messiah. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. God speaks to Zechariah and he says, your son will turn people's hearts to the Lord. He's going to direct their attention to them and he keeps going. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah would have known something when the angel said this that you and I might not know. These were basically the last words that were spoken through the prophet Malachi before the 400 years of silence. So the last words the people heard, the last ones they know, the last ones that they were sitting with and dwelling on go something like, he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. When the angel quotes this, it is as if he is saying, God is merely picking up the pen and starting right where he left off. It's powerful. And he goes, Zechariah, I choose you. You're going to play a role. You're going to play a part. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Imagine the roller coaster of hope that Zechariah is riding right now. The roller coaster of getting selected and then fear. And then you're in the temple and you have peace and then you're terrified and then you hear the word that was given through the angel to you from God himself. I mean, a roller coaster. Here, here's why I love this story so much is it's actually so relatable. Zechariah is just a normal guy. He's just ordinary. He's just doing what he was called to do. He was waiting. He endured a significant season of hardship and of pain. And he was accustomed to waiting, waiting individually, waiting as a family, waiting as a nation. <clears throat> so the question I have for all of you that would be similar to what, what we could have asked Zechariah is this, is what are you hoping for right now? If you look at the season that you're in, what are you waiting for? Maybe it's been a period of silence, maybe it's been a period of Questions. Maybe it's been a season of unknown. Maybe it's just been a season of hardship. What, what is it that you're actually hoping for right now? If you're anything like me, uh, this is an easy question to answer and then a hard question to answer. I like asking these types of questions. I don't like answering them. Last night I was sitting in here and, and I kept coming back to that question, what is it that I'm hoping for? What is it that I'm hoping for? What, what is it that I want? And, and for you, maybe, maybe it's something like this. Maybe the lottery ticket thing connects with you and you go, you know what, you know what the lottery ticket stands for? Uh, for me, it's a new life. It's a restart. It's a relief. It's, a, it's an escape to get away from what I'm experiencing right now. Maybe, maybe it's a wedding or an engagement Maybe you desire a partner or a spouse or somebody to do the rest of your life with. Maybe for you it's like a check or a bonus or a surprise, something that, that translates into financial security. Maybe it's a pregnancy test, a positive one. Maybe you can so relate to Zechariah and Elizabeth saying, I've lived that life, I've been on that journey, we're in that journey right now. And it's been question after question. It's been unknown after unknown. It's been no after no after no. And so the season that we're in right now is just waiting. Maybe it's a health test that comes back all clear to say, stamped, you're good, you're free, you're in remission. Maybe for you it's peace. Peace in your family, peace in your marriage, peace in your mind. What, what is it for you? For me, last night, here's some of the ones that I, I would say are, are normal that maybe you would go, yeah, I, I agree. I, I would hope for the same thing. This, the superficial, the lighter side would be this. Uh, I hope my kids love Jesus as adults someday. As I look at my kids, I, I can't control that. I can try to lead them towards that, but I, I hope that someday they love Jesus, that they want to walk with him, that they want to serve in their local church. This next one, I, I hope my wife loves me when my kids are gone someday. I really hope for that. I desire that. I hope to be a grandpa someday. I hope to have grandkids of my own. I hope to get to spoil them and to do all the stuff that all of you grandparents get to do. I hope I get to do that someday. 
This last one, I hope to have enough money to retire someday. <laughs> that one connects deeper for me. Here's, here's some of the deep stuff, though. I wrote, I hope my neighborhood is peaceful because it hasn't been this year. You know, where, where we live, we've had police out. We had police out four times in a matter of two weeks. It's, it's created what a home as a refuge should be. It's created the opposite of that. So what am I hoping for? Man, I'm hoping for peace just in my neighborhood, just in my street with my neighbors. Here's another one. Uh, I'm hoping my family can work through some really deep stuff. Because so far we haven't been able to. Right now it's been dysfunctional, painful, hard, with no real end inside. I'm hoping we can work through some of that stuff, but the season we're in right now is waiting. Here's another one. I hope our country realizes that we need what we need right now is not a president, but Jesus. That's what I'm hoping for right now. What are you hoping for? It's easy to answer first, but the longer you sit and the deeper it goes, the more you can say, man, that, that is a drive for me. That is a desire for me. Here, here's the problem with all of those things that I just listed. Which one of those does God promise? Which one does he say, yes, I will give you that? Here it is in my word. You can open up my word. Here, here's the thing. I'm going to promise that. I'm going to give that to you. I'm going to give you the thing that you desire, the thing that you waited for. Where, where is it in scripture that God says, I will give you all or any of those things? They're not. It's not in there. There is no guarantee for that. So oftentimes, I think God doesn't answer our prayers. So what do we do? We, we take matters into our own hands. We look at our own circumstances or our own abilities or our capabilities or what we can dictate. And instead of saying, God, I'm going to wait on you and I'm going to put my hope in you, instead what we do is we shift our hope and we shift that attention to ourselves or to the other things that are around us. And we say, maybe if I bring about these changes myself, I can get the thing that I'm hoping for all on my own. And I think we do that all the time in Zechariah because he's human, because he's normal, because he's average, just like all of us. He does the exact same thing. Instead of looking at what has God promised me, how do I rely back and fall back on the promises that God has given me? And it's all throughout scripture. How, how, how can I put my hope in that rather than in myself? So here's what Zechariah does. Here's how the story uh, continues on. It's Luke chapter one, verse 18. It says, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure that this will happen? I love this part. He goes, he says, I'm an old man now. He's going, look at this. This can't do what you're talking about. He's saying, I'm an old man now. And then he changes. And my wife is also well along in years. Any other husband notice the change of verbiage there? <laughs> smart, Zechariah, smart. I'm an old man, but my wife is well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Zechariah turns his attention and he goes, I can't do what you just said is going to happen. I'm not capable of that. My wife's not capable of that. We can't do that. We can't do our part. And he looks at his own humanity and he looks at his own ability and his capabilities and he says, what you just said can't happen. And the angel responds and says, nobody asked you who you are. Look at who I am. I'm Gabriel. I'm a messenger of God and I brought you this good news. You know what that word good news means? It's the gospel. I brought you this good news and it's the good news that comes from your heavenly father, the God who heard your prayer, the God who's been close to you, the God who cares for you, the God who's walked with you, the God listens to you. That God speaks and he has a word for you. And here is that word. And the angel continues. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. So put yourself in the shoes of a preacher at this very moment. What do you do with that? I don't know. Zechariah questions. He doubts. I think he wants to believe. 
he wants to believe what the angel just said is true, but he looks at his own fallenness and his own humanity and his own mortality, and he looks at the circumstances he finds himself in, and he questions the word of God. So often, I think what we do is we focus so much on what we hope for and what we can achieve without God, and we miss what God has already promised that can only be delivered by him. What the angel invites Zechariah to do is the same thing that God is inviting Zechariah to do and us to do, is to shift our attention, to shift our hope from the thing that we think needs to happen, from the relief that we think we need, or from the season that we want to step into, or from the the resolution that we deeply desire. We need to shift our attention off of the thing and move it to the person of Jesus That's the invitation that God is giving us. It's the invitation that God gave to Zechariah. Here's how it ends. Luke chapter 1, verse 21. It says, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. This I love this verse in the text because it tells you this is taking way longer than anybody's used to. They're all praying outside and they're praying for Zechariah. And at some point they start crossing their mind, I don't think that guy's alive anymore. Think about it, because they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and no Zechariah. And you start praying, but then you start thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're praying, but you're going, God, I just pray for him and pray that he would be alive. But if he's not alive, I pray that we would find it soon so we can stop this whole thing and move on. I don't know what's going through the people's heads, but it says the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. And then when he finally did come out, he could not speak to them. They realized from some of his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. To the roller coaster of emotion. Imagine what it must have been like for Zechariah to have this unbelievable encounter with an angel a year before Jesus even enters the scene, an invitation to be a part of God fulfilling the biggest and most important promise he ever made to humanity, not leading them to a circumstance that is better, leading them to a person, and the person is their own son, Zechariah. When God speaks to him, he says, I'm going to give you a son circumstance. But the intention of the answered prayer for his son was to point to the ultimate son, the son of God. God was inviting Zechariah, just like he invites all of us, to shift our hope, to move our hope from the thing to the person of Jesus. Said differently, I would say it just like this. The greatest hope that we have is the person of Jesus. Not a better season, not a clear diagnosis, not a child, not relief, not not no more suffering, not peace, not just Jesus. The greatest hope we have is Jesus. If you notice, we have this candle up here. Uh, It's called an Advent candle. And each week we'll get to light a different one because all four of these candles represent something differently. But the first one that we get to light today represents hope. And ultimately it'll move us to the person of Jesus, to focusing and centering on the person of Jesus. As we close today, I just want to ask you before we go into our closing worship said, it's just what, what are you hoping for right now? What do you find yourself waiting for? What do you find yourself longing for? Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for a spouse. Maybe it's for a child. Maybe it's for a job. Maybe it's something financial related, health related. What is it, what is it that you are actually hoping for right now? asking God for right now 
The second question is this, how is Jesus inviting you to place your hope in him? How is he inviting you into that? How is he inviting you to shift your focus, not from a thing, but to the person of Jesus? Jesus is the greatest hope that we've ever been promised. He was promised. Jesus, I mean, here's, he, he promises to be with us, as we're going to sing in a second. Emmanuel, God with us. That was a promise that God made, and it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. He, Jesus promises total forgiveness and grace. That was promised. The greatest hope you can have is in him. He, he promises a future with him. He promises that he defeated death. He defeated it on the cross. Jesus offers freedom from sin and from darkness and from addiction. Jesus offers it. It was promised to us. It was promised to his followers. Jesus can fulfill that. The greatest hope that we have is in the person of Jesus. Jesus promises that he will love for us. He will love us and care for us deeply. He promises to hear our prayers, to be close, to be proximate. He's the greatest hope that we could ever ask for. He's a proximate God that hears us. So how is Jesus inviting you to place your hope in him? I have two verses I wanted to read just as we close. And then we can just sit in a time of prayer. First one is this, it's Psalm 147, 11, and it says this, the Lord delights in those who fear him who put their hope in his unfailing love. I love that verse. The Lord delights in you. He's overjoyed with you. He's just so proud of you. When you move your hope from a thing to the person of Jesus, the, the second one is this. It's Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. It says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray together. God, right now, we just come to you uh, with a variety of things that we hope for, with a variety of things that we desire, with a variety of things that we've been waiting for, some of us, uh, for a long time maybe decades, maybe forever, God. Maybe there's something that we've hoped for and we've desired that's right and true and good and yet hasn't happened. God, I just pray right now for just the disappointment that so many of us feel for the loss of hope, the hopelessness that maybe is more common than the feeling of hope. I pray for the pain that exists in this room and in the lives of so many people who desire something from you, who have come to you like Zechariah and Elizabeth. Maybe they lived a life that has been seeking after and desiring to please you, and yet that prayer hasn't been answered. I pray for the pain that's associated with that. I pray for those that are just asking a lot of questions right now. Maybe questioning you, maybe questioning somebody else questioning the tunnel that they're in, looking at the end saying, I, I don't even know if there is a light at the end of this tunnel. I just pray for them. I pray for those that are experiencing loss right now who had hope that you would answer a prayer differently and then you didn't. God, we know hope has a name and his name is Jesus. I pray right now that you would do what only you can do, divert our attentions and our affections from temporary relief is fulfilled in Jesus. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. Amen. So as we go into this last couple minutes together, um, I'll just invite you if you want to stand or sit or kneel, however you want to posture yourself in worship. Um, 
There's just those two questions that David asked that I want to bring back to our minds. What are you hoping for? And how is Jesus inviting you to place your hope in him? So we're going to do a song that we actually opened the service with, but it just fit the theme so well we had to do it again. And so sing it, listen to it, um, pray just in that spirit of hope has a name and his name is Emmanuel and he wants to meet you today. So let's worship.
what a powerful way to end. So, hey, two quick things uh, as you leave today. Uh, the first one is this, Courtney mentioned the trees that are out in the lobby. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people that we're gonna go interact with all week this week that don't have hope. Those trees are an opportunity for us to grab one of those tags to go be the hands and feet of Jesus to a world that is so desperate for him, whether they realize it or not. So as you leave, if you wanna grab one, some of those are time-based. It's just sacrificing and spending some of your time to invest in the kingdom of God through other people. Others of them are financial oriented. It's just an opportunity to bless those that are around us in Jesus' name this Christmas. Uh, But it leads to the second one is this, to invite people to come experience and come meet hope. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. It's who we were just singing singing to. So grab that card and remember that card's not for you. That card's for somebody that you live next to, somebody that you work with. Maybe it's a family member, somebody that's at home with you that maybe hasn't been at church in a long time. Maybe they don't have a relationship with God. Who needs hope right now that you can invite them to be a part of the kingdom of God? So I wanna invite you, if you wanna extend your hands like this, it's a posture of reception. We, we love to close here with a benediction at Frontline, so it just means blessing. I just wanna bless you on your way out. So brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Jesus' name and all God's people said together. Amen. Love you guys a lot. We'll see you next week for part two of Spirit of Christmas.